Before the Panama Canal, getting from the Atlantic to the Pacific was a massive feat. You had two options, the Strait of Magellan or the Drake Passage. Either way, it was going to be a major detour, to say the least. Several attempts were made to significantly shorten the trip, and what seemed like an ideal location was the incredibly narrow Isthmus of Panama. While there was discussion about the prospect of a Panama Canal centuries prior to the canal's completion, no plans came to fruition. Instead, a railroad would bridge the oceans first. In 1846, the United States and New Granada, a long since defunct Central American state, agreed on a treaty giving the United States transportation rights in the region, allowing for the construction of the Panama Railway, a major undertaking that would allow a new way to transport goods across the continent, although it did only need to stretch around 48 miles to do so. While obviously beneficial, the railway still didn't allow ship transport, and a full canal would be the ideal next step. It wouldn't be the Americans to start this though. No, it would be the French. More specifically, this man, Ferdinand du Lesseppe. He was a diplomat who had previously led construction on the Suez Canal. Completed in 1869, this joins the Mediterranean and Red Seas. It was about 102 miles long, and by comparison, the Panama Canal seemed like a completely feasible task. After all, it would be half the length. Oh, he was wrong. After receiving Colombia's permission, New Granada was now the United States of Colombia, Ferdinand began raising funds for this great endeavor. His previous achievements with the Suez made gaining investors' trust an easy task. And with the money, work began on the Panama Canal. The first and most obvious issue was the landscape. The rainforest climate and ecosystem was hard to traverse and filled with dangerous animals. Adding to this, Ferdinand surveyed the land during the dry season of the year, and when the rain started, the additional water caused even more complications. The biggest issue, however, was disease. Malaria, yellow fever, and more contributed to the deaths of about 22,000 people. The construction project was in trouble, not to mention the money of its contributors. As funds dried up, construction stopped, and the canal remained unfinished. A new French company, run by this man, we'll just call him Felipe, came in control of the assets, but not to necessarily complete the canal. This company, literally called New Panama Canal Company, saw an opportunity to reach out to the Americans. The United States was at the time interested in a canal across Nicaragua, but with the benefits of equipment and partly excavated land, made Panama seem like the better choice. In 1903, a deal was reached by the US and a Colombian diplomat, to grant the United States a land lease, but was rejected by the Colombian Senate. Teddy Roosevelt didn't take this rejection kindly. The head of the new Panama Canal Company and the Roosevelt administration collaborated in an effort to help a current Panama rebellion. The administration told the rebels to declare independence, and after that the United States would protect them from the Colombian government's wrath. So on November 3rd, 1903, Panama rebels announced their independence from Colombia. While the Colombians made attempts to squash the rebels, American Navy ships were sent to interfere with Colombian transports. The American interference worked, and within 10 days, America recognized Panama as an independent country. On November 18th, 1903, the High Banal Varilla Treaty was signed. This was between the U.S. and the newly formed Panama, giving the U.S. control of the planned canal zone in exchange for a yearly fee plus an initial payment of $10 million. Finally, in 1904, the United States began work on the Panama Canal, buying the assets from the new Panama Canal Company. Ten years later, the canal was completed. Not without great cost, of course. It cost the equivalent of around $9 billion U.S. dollars, adjusted for inflation, and about 5,600 additional lives were lost. The benefits were immediate, however, as ships could finally traverse the two large oceans without going around South America. The canal would become a distinct marker for the world's transportation and an asset of the United States. However, the distinct difference between the American-owned canal zone and Panama would grow as the decades progressed. On January 9, 1963, Panamanian citizens entered the canal zone attempting to put up Panama's flag next to the U.S. flag. This resulted in Americans and Panamanians fighting in what escalated into a three-day riot in the area, resulting in four U.S. soldiers' deaths 
along with 22 Panamanians. Soon after, Panama would break diplomatic ties with the US, and a new regime under Omar Torrijos took power after a coup, causing a change in the political tide. All this would culminate in 1977, when President Jimmy Carter signed the Torrijos Carter Treaties. Under this, Panama would receive the canal and the land surrounding it, after the year 1999. Of course, the immediate response was mixed by the American public. After all, the Panama Canal had resulted in thousands of American deaths, not to mention the massive monetary investment. On the opposing side, the move was seen as diffusing of tensions, a reduction to the American expansion decades prior. Today, the move is still decisive. Some applaud the move as selfless, others see it as foolish. I'm not here to give my thoughts on the matter, so don't even ask. The Panama Canal was, at the time, the jewel in America's crown. It represented the grand achievements the nation was capable of, along with the expansionist attitudes within the Western Hemisphere. In a way, it's the culmination of attitudes and achievements. For better or worse, I'll let you decide. This is Cody of Knowledge Hub.